Welcome to Circuit Talk, Funders and Founders. I'm John Cole, Senior Manager on the Semiconductor Team at MITRE Ingenuity. We are a nonprofit dedicated to solving problems for a safer world. Our semiconductor team is hard at work meeting the nation's challenges around semiconductor breakthrough technologies and the CHIPS Act. Circuit Talk, Funders and Founders, is part of MITRE's Circuit Talk podcast and video series, and it elevates the revolutionary, disruptive work being done by semiconductor entrepreneurs and investors. This is an exciting time to be working with semiconductor startups. The nation is waking up to just how critical they are to our national and economic security. I'm joined today on Circuit Talk Funders and Founders by Ron Kelly, who's CEO of Ambature. Ron's a lawyer by training. He studied law and business earning an MBA and a JD from Dalhousie University. His IP training started at one of Canada's largest law firms. And since he's led a number of companies as CEO, where managing intellectual property was just a very important role within the company. Today, Ron is CEO of Ambiture, an IP licensing company active in superconductive materials and the semiconductor space. So welcome, Ron. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Well, I gave, I opened up with a few hints about your story. Um, you've had an interesting journey here to talk about semiconductors today, and you're the first lawyer that we've had on uh, funders and founders. So how'd you find your way from law school to where you are now with Ambiture? Yeah, uh, when I graduated from Dalhousie, I had a choice to make. One was to go into business right away because I actually have two finance degrees or to be a lawyer. And uh, I was very interested in banking law. So mm -hmm. I actually was recruited by one of the banks in Canada to go in-house, but I was also offered a job from one of the biggest banking firms in the country. So I figured it was just as easy to learn my trade as an outside lawyer and then go in-house as, as opposed to the opposite, which is a little bit more difficult. So, so I chose law first. I practiced law for seven years. And then like many lawyers, you actually get recruited by one of your clients. That's exactly what happened to me. A company that was getting ready to go public. It was half of my practice. And uh, they gave me the opportunity to uh, stop actually practicing law on a day to day basis and help build a company take it public, be on the board. And uh, at the time, it was a perfect time for me actually to switch out of law. Um, and I decided to do it. That was about four companies ago. <laughs> and I've been involved in uh, multiple tech opportunities since then. And once you actually start uh, to run a business, even if you have a legal background, it's very difficult to go back. Uh, <laughs> you, love, you enjoy building things. I, I've always enjoyed building things. I enjoyed building my law practice. So now I've enjoyed building uh, Ambature, which is now my fourth company. That's great. Serial entrepreneurship. So tell us, what are you building at Ambature and what problem are you solving for your customers right now? So, so Ambature is a quantum platform, very deep uh, in quantum mechanics. We are trying to address a number of problems that exist in classical uh, computing, typical silicon-based uh, materials. So, you know, if you go to many conferences in the semiconductor space now, you won't be there very long before they talk about Moore's Law is, you know, coming to its end. Um, we need new architectures and we need new materials. Well, that's exactly what Amateur is. We use superconductive materials, which can be used in addition to or uh, a substitute for silicon. Um, and we actually use a very unique uh, architecture, which is along the A axis. In simple English, we build our materials at the atomic level vertically from the substrate, as opposed to where we make most things today, which is flat or the horizontal axis. Can you unpack a little bit more about how the, the superconductors you're making now, how that's going to fit into what we typically think of as semiconductors, right? Thinking superconductors, I think the first thing I think of is, say, high tension transmission lines or other places where, you know, you just want to be able to conduct with very little resistance, but where, where how, how does this material fit into semiconductors? Yeah. So, so we, we provide solutions in terms of uh, the resistance problem, which most of you would understand as heat, heat in your computer, heat in your iPhone, your battery dying faster, that kind of uh, problem. We, we also address uh, the sensing issue. Sensing detecting is very important. That's usually done on the silicon substrate and actually clean energy. So mm -hmm. drilling down a little bit on the computing side, we're very, very fortunate. We can uh, address multiple opportunities. We can actually 
use our materials to make existing um, semiconductor silicon-based chips faster because the semiconductor actually has slow movement of current through the material. Superconductors have no resistance. So you automatically uh, have the ability to look at things like high-speed interconnects. And the mm -hmm. more chips we try to jam on a typical substrate, um, your wires get thinner and your heat gets bigger because yeah. of resistance. So we address from a pure compute perspective, the issue of need more power, more efficient power, more speed, and greater density. So all of these things are combined in a uh, bolt-on to silicon. It could be something like a chiplet, for example, or you could just use our materials. From a sensing perspective, many, many sensors that people use today uh, for the IoT, that kind of stuff, much of that is silicon-based. So what you're having challenges with are the typical signal-to-noise ratio. Superconductors just happen to be probably the best sensor in the entire electromagnetic spectrum. When we take pictures of deep space, for example, that is a superconductor squid enhanced image that you're receiving. Okay. So if you can take advantage of things like this technology for deep space imaging, imagine what it could do in an MRI application, for example. Imagine oh, yeah. what it could do in detecting signals, even in the small dynamic range of multiple signals coming into the front end of a cell phone base station. Um, these are the kinds of things we focus upon. And the lack of resistance, remember, is also important for what we all care about, which is clean energy. Mm -hmm. Data centers you know, need air conditioning. Uh, they need cold water coming through the floors, entire architecture just to deal with the heat, which is generated by these server farms, whether it's cloud-based or your typical data center, um, even a small data center in your company. They all generate heat. They need to be architected to deal with the cooling problem. So advanced computing, advanced sensing, detecting, and clean energy. That's really what we're trying to focus on right now. Well, for, for semiconductors, it sounds like you're going to open up broader computing, faster computing, but also reduce the environmental footprint maybe of some of the centers that use it, especially, like you said, high use centers, like uh, um, data centers, things like that. When you talk to your customers, which which one of those is most important right now or where are you finding the most demand? Actually, it's actually in our sensor, uh, sensor detector. Okay. A lot of it is actually military driven. The ability to detect and map uh, different mm -hmm. things is quite important to multiple uh, militaries around the world right now. It has been enhanced by certain concerns in different countries, as I'm sure you're aware of. But any kind of superconductive sensor detector is 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 really really good for example if you are in a combat situation you can make something called a bolometer which actually is an infrared application of a superconductive sensor if you want it to be superconductive where you can actually see the enemy before the enemy sees you you hmm. can use it for enhanced radar uh, so you can see uh, enemy aircraft coming before they can see you, for example. Same thing for missiles. So right now, I would say 80% of our effort and our pipeline is really actually uh, detection. Uh, the superconductive chip sensor is actually called a SQUID, superconductive quantum uh, interference device. Uh, okay. That's, that, that's what we spend a lot of our time architecting right now. Well, you mentioned chiplets a few times in sort of describing the technology. Can you unpack a little bit more about what they are for those of us that don't know and, and how they fit into your technology? Yeah, yeah chip, chiplets are very important. They're, they're actually one of the major drivers in the entire semiconductor industry right now. It's 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 been around for a while, but uh, under the Chips and Science Act, under the PCAS report for the president and the White House, um, you see very specific provisions to enhance a chiplet platform, a chiplet strategy, uh, a chiplet ecosystem, but in, in, in simple in English, um, think of it as a modular approach to making integrated circuits. Uh, yeah. some people use the Lego analogy, for example, where you put a Lego block on something and it gets bounded, but it's actually an excellent analogy. So chiplets can save a tremendous amount of money. And from an IP perspective, it, it is it is a wonderful opportunity to get into the semiconductor industry because you can just focus on creating what people call an IP block or a chiplet where you don't need to have to worry about making the wafer or making the integrated circuit, growing um, and fabricating all the vias. All you need to do is to do what's called wafer bonding or wire bonding uh, onto an existing chip. 
So AMD, uh, NVIDIA, Intel, all of these companies are doing it now. And mm -hmm. it's great for young companies, particularly amateur, because we have a very focused, highly functional chip. We don't have to do all of that work. We can just work with the major semi-players or the major foundries and have them do, for lack of a better term, much of the heavy lifting. We just yeah. supply the chiplet. It's actually good from their perspective as well, because our chiplets and most chiplets would be made offline. So mm -hmm. that chip will be built somewhere else. It could be tested somewhere else. So if you're going to bond it onto a silicon chip to make a broader, more functional integrated circuit, that's already tested. The, the, the last thing in the world you want is to create a 12 inch wafer and then find out there's something wrong with it. It affects the yield and, and chiplets are one way to do it. And um, it's a very important part of the future, particularly for IP based companies, because in many yeah. respects, you may not have anything other than some IP that one of the semis or many of the semis can't reproduce because you've got a patent on it, for example, which is very important in our case. Well, coming coming back to your analogy about Legos, I like that. It's then so you can kind of snap different pieces together to come up with a new configuration or something that's not there before. Uh, implies there's got to be a standard, right? <laughs> or exactly. something that everybody can kind of play with and build build to to, to snap it together. How's that coming? <laughs> No, it's actually good. We we have two wafer bonding chiplet projects underway right now. One is actually started with people that are very experienced in the industry with uh, superconductive chiplet strategies, wafer bonding, wafer. There's many words that go with it, um, but basically uh, we we have mapped it out. We we've already started one project. We're looking forward to the second, and it 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 will be not just for us, but for many small companies, a, a way, an easy way for semiconductors to adopt what we're trying to accomplish with a very focused, specific type of functionality that they don't own. And in our case, you can't own it unless you have a license from us because we have patents in pretty well the bulk of the world, including almost every major area that makes uh, chips. Yeah. Well, so sort of putting on your lawyer hat for a second and thinking about IP and, and protecting that, right? You sort of mentioned that earlier, most firms in this space they they breathe and die on IP so, you know, everywhere throughout the semiconductor industry. One of the challenges or the desires of the CHIP Act, if you will, is to sort of keep that IP here in the US. Do you think that's a, a good idea? It's it's an international sort of endeavor to put one of these together, but are we actually protecting American interests there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we are. I mean, uh, I, I support the, the the federal government's initiative to protect certain areas of our IP that you know should not necessarily be uh, a, available to people that may misuse it against us you know it, it's a very difficult question because we all like trade trade is good for us right. but in the semiconductor space we have found ourselves in a in a precarious position particularly on the high end chips that we need for military purposes hence the onshoring and the, the policy behind the chips and science act let's get these foundries here uh, and let's start making all these chips uh, in the United States. Yeah, well, th there's a movement in other parts of the industry and some other startups we talked to have focused on sort of open source and new tools and new products that are coming out that sort of uh, coming out of an open source movement and more semiconductor tool chains, more IP. How do you think from a sort of zooming back out away from amateur for a second, how's that going to work for um, for startups and for the semiconductor industry? Well, I, I I think it may be difficult because it's a competitive industry. Well, one one large semiconductor's competitive advantage is their access to tools and commercial equipment and actually having a foundry, whether you have it and you own it like a TSMC or you have your chips made by someone like TSMC if you're AMD. But for all the young companies, what, what I'm seeing and all the conversations I'm having is there is a willingness from the industry, finally, to start mm -hmm. opening up uh, their PDKs and uh, yeah. broader access to EDA tools, some you know sense of nurturing and trying to help young companies, because at the end of the day, the Chips and Science Act is about you know helping the country, you know, develop our own homegrown larger semiconductor industry. So while it won't be easy um, because of the competitive aspect of our industry, um, I'm seeing great opportunities to collaborate with larger companies. And the Chips and Science Act, the fact that they're going to, you know, put up a lot of money for this, particularly the chiplet platform, as we've already talked about, yeah. I, I'm actually quite optimistic about it. 
when I was a younger man, Microsoft really dominated sort of the computing space, right? That was the only, more or less for a while, the only operating system. It was closed source and almost not, not overnight, but pretty quickly over the last 20 years, Linux has come to really dominate uh, being sort of an open source platform. I wonder if there's a good analogy in there or, or maybe there's not because it's, you know, hardware versus software. Uh, as these companies sort of open up PDKs and tool chains and more folks can come in and inspect them or more folks can come in and use them differently. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the open source hasn't destroyed the software community, maybe quite the opposite, right? Um, any thoughts on where that goes or where that lands? Do, do companies, you know, I think Skywater sort of leading the charge on open sourcing the PDKs. I, I, yeah. I know there's a lot of uh, discussion about that in the industry. Uh, some PDKs are public, some are not. Um, uh, I, I know that there are discussions going on where people feel that these things need to be more open sourced. I mean, if you're a small company, uh, yeah. you know, you need to know what you're trying to hit. <laughs> you know, it's a big deal to try to get TSMC or Samsung or Intel or anybody to change their workflow in a foundry. So if you don't know what that workflow is and what the requirements are, it's very difficult to hit it. So yeah. it means you need to get engaged with them at some level just to get the right person. Um, and these are huge companies. They're all very busy, you know, to get the right person who can actually coach you as to what your process needs to look like in order to integrate with a PDK for a large foundry. Uh, th these are not little things. Um, as I said, you know, yeah. one company's competitive advantage is a barrier to entry to somebody else. Well, so switching gears a little bit and sort of putting back back on your startup hat at Ambature, it's eventually you're going to have to engage larger fabs maybe for this. Developing process at scale, sharing the IP, tricky things to do, especially for startups point of view. Not everyone's blessed with a uh, an IP lawyer as CEO, right? So can you talk a little bit about that process as a startup, what it's like to sort of negotiate with a, a you know, a larger entity of fab and try to get in there and, and, and get some time on the fab to make your, your chips. Well, most of these conversations, thankfully start with an NDA. Uh, most companies are willing to sign an NDA. And if they're not, you may want to question whether you really want to do business with them. There, there are companies in the semiconductor industry around the world that are uh, amenable to these kinds of conversations and signing NDA. Some are not. There's a, there's a problem in many industries where you you own a foundry, for example, or you have many scientists doing what the person you're speaking to is doing, you don't want those scientists tainted with whatever is being disclosed to you. So, yeah. so you have to be very careful about those kinds of relationships. You, you want to work with them, you need to work with them, but you really want an NDA to protect what you're doing. So then you fall down to the next level, which is you only disclose what you absolutely have to disclose in the absence of an NDA. Uh, and um, hopefully you have enough money and some decent patent lawyers where you can actually file patents because you file a patent before you even discuss it with anybody outside of an NDA. That's pretty fundamental for any uh, IP strategy. And if you have a large IP portfolio, the bigger it is, the easier it is to enforce. And uh, it's harder for people to actually try to what they get patent around it. So, you know, again, I'm optimistic <laughs> that uh, these things are all going to be easier to deal with for small companies. Now, small companies are hard enough to build as it is. <laughs> I've right. been involved in multiple of them and or many of them. And even as a corporate lawyer, uh, not a lot of them are successful. So uh, having the ability to work with larger players is important. I hope it becomes easier than it is today. Does, does, if I understand correctly, so chiplets kind of allows you to protect it a little bit more easily. Do, are you like lowering the exposure to the different technology, uh, different different players at the the forge, or how does that work? Well, if if you have the money and 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 you have the wherewithal, you will actually file a patent or a provisional patent immediately when you come up with the idea. That that is the ultimate, um, and you know. Patents are not for the faint of heart because they're very expensive, particularly if you want to, you know, register them around the world. I mean, you care about Taiwan, you care about China, you care about South Korea, you care about Canada, you care about the U.S. And you want those markets and you want to be protected in those markets. But, you know, language translation fees are expensive. Patent lawyers are expensive. Maintenance fees are expensive. But so so you have to find a balance about what is really important to you. And, and, and do you really need a patent to protect what you're trying to protect? Yeah. Um 
in, in many respects, uh, an NDA may just get you where you want to get to, and then supplement it with trademarks and trade secrets and and, and things like that. It's it's a mixed bag. You know, if you have the money, um, you should certainly consider it. Is there is there anything uh, that we can do? You know, we've got the Chips Act funding coming along. NSTC will be doing R and D. Is there anything we can do in that space to that helps startups protect their IP? Uh, yeah, to sort of do that defensive work you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, uh, IP is a very difficult, complex issue. Uh, I know a lot of people are discussing it in the context of the Chips and Science Act right now. We, we need to get it get the money out <laughs> from uh, from the, the Department of Commerce as fast as possible to these young startups and the universities so we can start to innovate the way the the, the policy initiative of the statute is supposed to be supported. The, the nurturing part's important as well. You know, don't, don't underscore what it means to have people in the industry that have been around for 20, 30 years help you because, mm -hmm. you know, these entrepreneurs come from different streams of life, university, they're in yeah. the industry, they just want to be in the semiconductor industry or the superconductor industry. I mean, you know, it, it is it is something that if the government can get the money out sooner rather than later, that will really help providing access to incubators, for example, universities or otherwise. Many of them actually have lawyers, they have people who've been through it before. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that's probably what they can do. You talked a, a bit about the different places just now about where entrepreneurs sort of emerge from and come into the semiconductor industry. And through your experience, you've seen more than a few startups kind of launch out of the lab space into the commercial space or been there for a good deal of that journey. What can we do in the U.S. to sort of make it a better place or a more nurturing ecosystem, if you will, to, to help R&D folks or folks with an idea in a lab get it out of the lab and get it into the commercial space? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes a village. It really does. Yeah. If you're associated with a university that has the capability and or an incubator, um, and we're going to get a lot more of them under the CHIPS Act, we hope, um, you know, you, you really, you really need to go and seek out these people who can help you. And, and there are actually lots of people who are willing to help you, retired, you know, executives and engineers and physicists from the various semiconductor companies. And, and, uh, but it, 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 it's a lot of work. <laughs> this is not an easy industry to break into where you try to break industry into the industry matters very much. Are you, are you on the, the wafer side? Are you on the foundry side? Because, you know, a new foundry is $20 billion, right? Okay. What I really like about the chips act, which is probably worth pointing out is things like a chiplet strategy, the chiplet ecosystem, Mm -hmm. that becoming a common platform, and I believe the date is 2025, that is uh, wonderful for young companies because you can eliminate all that capital cost and just focus on new functionality that really matters, that solves a real problem. I mean, the, the process node innovation in semiconductors is really important. That's why if you can get it patented and somehow protect it um, and nurture it and get it to the point where you can create a chiplet, um, and, mm -hmm. and wafer bonded onto a silicon wafer. You, you are very, very far advanced. In terms could, you, could you explain yeah. real quick? One thing I didn't follow there was uh, the the new chiplets will reduce the capital cost to bring something to market, right? Yes. And, and what, is, what, are we, what are we cutting out when we use a chiplet versus, say, the traditional route? Oh, I mean, um, you know, the uh, ability to, or the lack of need in order to create the entire... Uh, full stack from, you know, creating the wafer and, and the chip design, EDA tools, commercial equipment, commercial testing, uh, access to a foundry. I mean, there's a reason why many companies in this industry are fabulous because mm -hmm. the capital cost to actually be in this industry is, is enormous. That's why you have pure foundry police. So the chiplet lets you focus on what you're good at, hopefully patented it, hopefully get a good chip design. And then get someone who's willing to do the wafer bonding process for you. And then you're, you're, I mean, that's minuscule compared to what it would take to actually do this in the way that TSMC does, for example. When we were talking about some of the capabilities amateurs, superconductors provide once we get it all together, there's the modularity of bringing, say, process and memory and sensors all together into one place, the lowering of power, the growth of compute. What sort of applications and uh, use cases do you see this coming out to 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 really attack that um, we may not be seeing right now? 
Sure. A big one would be data centers. I mean, you, you can imagine uh, what's involved in building these data centers and, and, and some of them, they're just getting bigger and bigger. You know, the amount of heat that's generated in these server racks is not insignificant. Yeah. The architecture of these data centers is not necessarily the most efficient uh, way to produce these things. But we're very focused on reducing the heat. If you reduce the heat, you don't need all the cooling. Uh, yeah. You need some cooling in order to cool superconductive chips. That's true. But if you think about the move to the edge and edge data centers, uh, literally underneath the uh, a telecom pole, you can have all the advantages right there. You can have a uh, superconductive sensor detector uh, and amplifier in a cell phone base station, and you can have a small data center at the bottom of the pole. And that small data center can be cooled quite easily with liquid nitrogen um, and have the tank refilled from time to time. These are the things we're looking at. I mean, you have huge private equity companies like KKR that are actually now out buying data centers. You yeah. have American Tower buying data centers. I mean, the, the American Tower just spent $12 billion on a bunch of data centers. So you're you're talking about somebody just the other day that said that data centers in the U.S. use just as much power, you know, as uh, I think the city of San Francisco does. So if we just, you know, reduce that or wipe that much power off the grid, that would be a huge uh, benefit for for sustainability. When, when you think about that data center, though, sitting at the bottom of a telecom pole, think about the other sort of secondary effects that has in the market too, right? you the infrastructure that goes into backhaul the data to processing centers or the infrastructure it takes to get a lot of electricity and data into different places in the world, that uh, that could have a significant impact, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Just, just think about where does the electricity come from that actually gets to the data center, through the data center. It has to be, I think it has to be stepped up and stepped down eight times in terms of voltage before it even hits the server. We're very focused on the actual server problem and the heat and the cooling required to do that, let alone speed. I mean, it, this is about speed. You want it, you want it to be faster. You want it to be more energy efficient. And, and you know, the greater the density of these chips, the more heat there's going to be, the wires are thinner. It, it just gets worse. And, and the need for computing. Uh, I saw one statistic. Um, from one of the big players, they said by 2035, uh, at the rate we're going, we would need almost every bit of electricity in the world just to run our data centers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. you know, that's a problem. That's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, edge computing is a big opportunity for companies like us, you yeah. know, to be able to sense, detect at the edge and process the data at the edge to make a decision, for example, for autonomous cars or autonomous trucks. This is very important. Yeah. Camera feeds, LiDAR feeds, radar feeds, uh, processing that data in an instant uh, is, is where it needs to be. Trying to get it through a telecom system, through a data center, and have it processed and send an answer back, that's a latency problem. You, you, right. you can't have that decision made in, in, in less than a split second, and even that's not enough. So, you know, all of these opportunities, medical imaging, there's huge opportunities in superconductors and medical imaging, um, you know. MRIs are a uh, superconductor. A lot of people don't even realize that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, there's some cooling involved, but the ability to detect and sense things in the body, for example, we're working on applications now in life sciences that can detect proteins uh, using our materials. Wow. Uh, looking at making smaller MRI devices where you can literally have them in a, in a doctor's office. That is not just a detecting issue, that's a processing issue because you want to be able to process the data on the spot in the doctor's office. So there's enormous opportunities uh, in the chip and sensing space for us and in the clean energy space. And, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're just beginning. That's great. Wow. Ron, thanks for taking the time to share so much about Ambiture and the great work you're doing and the awesome difference that it's going to be in the world. Um, we hope to have you back soon. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.